Call the meeting to order, please. Will you call the roll? Okay, we're going to open this meeting today. You know, typically we close meetings every now and then in honor of someone who's made a great contribution. We will do that today as well, but I'm going to mix it up a little bit. And we're going to open this meeting in honor of Nancy McFadden, a great public servant, and I'm sure she's looking down at our agenda today and smiling because she played a key role in getting us all here today so with that we'll do a welcome to the region and celebrate for nancy a white life well lived okay so welcome to the region poway mayor and sandag vice chair steve voss Thank you, Chairman. I'm delighted to be here and to welcome the Commission to San Diego. You're coming at a great time. We've got major projects going on all around you with more on the way. Over the years, this Commission has been a tremendous partner in delivering critical transportation projects to the region. We appreciate and value our partnership with you and with all the agencies and stakeholders that are working hard to improve mobility here as well as make this a great place to live, work, and play. I want to highlight a few of the great things that have been made possible through our local sales tax measure, Transnet, and through our state and federal partners. You may have already seen if you've come down Interstate 5, we're making tremendous progress on the largest transportation infrastructure project ever undertaken in the region the $2 billion Mid-Coast Corridor Trolley Extension. This project is funded jointly, a billion dollars in local sales tax funds, which has attracted another billion dollars in federal New Start funds to build an 11-mile trolley extension to UCSD and University City, essentially the region's second downtown. We're also currently constructing the South Bay Bus Rapid Transit Project, say that 10 times fast. It'll improve mobility in one of our most congested areas, providing a competitive transportation alternative for travel between the border, South County, and the downtown area. Construction's also underway on the first segment of the I-5 North Coast Corridor Project, a unique multimodal project, including highway, rail, bike, and pedestrian components. This project, by the way, was made possible by a STIP funding allocation from the Commission. Within the North Coast Corridor, we're using Transnet sales tax dollars to undertake an extensive restoration of the San Alejo Lagoon in coordination with the highway and rail bridge work. Thank you, Senator Kehoe, for your help with this coordinated effort. We're also making progress on State Route 11 and Otay Mesa East Port of Entry, which are critical to the state's economy and to environmental sustainability. These projects would not be possible without the support of the CTC and the California State Transportation Agency and Caltrans. We're proud to be developing a strong reputation as a hub for technology and innovation. Just last week, Department of Transportation Secretary Elaine Chow announced that the San Diego region has been chosen as one of 10 locations in the country to participate as a drone testing site in the FAA's unmanned aircraft system integration pilot program. Just imagine, not too distant future, your Zappos orders will come to you via drone. That'll be a good thing. And in a bit, Sandag Chief Deputy Executive Director Kim Kawada will present information on the San Diego Regional Proving Ground, including important work on safety and public education surrounding autonomous vehicles. Your presence here and the investments you're making allow us to continue this high level of delivery on our commitments while at the same time allowing us to advance state goals and objectives. We're pleased to see on your agenda the recommendations for three 
of the SB1 programs under your purview. The Solutions for Congested Corridors Program, the Trade Corridors Enhancement Program, and the Competitive Local Partnership Program. We strongly support those recommendations for these programs and are eager to put shovels in the dirt. On a final note, tomorrow is Bike to Work Day here in the San Diego region. Participation in this event continues to grow every year. Last year, we had 10,500 visits to our pit stops. We're expecting thousands of commuters to bike to work again this year. We'll have 100 pit stop locations throughout the county, and giving away free t-shirts, refreshments, and encouragement to those that need it. Sandag staff do have some flyers here today, and if you want to participate, I'm sure we can get you a bike to go where you want to go. So let us know. In any event, welcome. Enjoy your stay, and thank you for standing shoulder to shoulder with us here in the region to support critical work being done in San Diego. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vice Chair. We're delighted to be here. Okay, moving on, item number three, Terry. Thank you. Under eminent domain law, a property owner whose property is under condemnation consideration has the right to appear before the commission to question three and only three issues. Number one, does public interest and necessity require the proposed project? Number two, is the project planned and located in a manner that will be most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury? Number three, is the property necessary for the proposed project? The commission neither determines the amount of compensation for the property rights to be acquired, nor deals with any issue other than the three just stated. Government Code Section 7267.2 requires the department to make an offer to purchase the property rights needed. The department has made the required offer. Code of Civil Procedures Section 1245.240 specifies eight affirmative votes for commission approval of a resolution of necessity. The commission scheduled this condemnation appearance at the request of property owner, owner Jeffrey Mayhew. This appearance relates to impacts caused by a $1.2 million shop safety project in San Bernardino on State Route 247. The impacted property is 157.15 acres in size. The department needs 1.3 acres in fee. Mike Whiteside, the department's assistant chief engineer, is ready to make the department's presentation to be followed by the property owner. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you, Terry. Again, I'm Mike Whiteside, the Assistant Chief Engineer for Caltrans. The department requests your approval of this resolution for a safety project on State Route 247 in District 8, San Bernardino County. The property is owned one-third interest by Carl Warnick, Jeffrey Mayhew, and Robert Mayhew, one-third interest, and the Helen S. Olney Trust, uh, one-third interest. Let's see here. The uh, project is located in rural San Bernardino County near Lucerne Valley. Um, the highway here is an undivided two-lane uh, conventional highway in rural desert. The highway begins down in Yucca Valley and traverses up to Barstow. So here you see the project location in blue. The subject parcel is in green. Uh, the, pro the project is located at the intersection with Camp Rock Road. Uh, this section of 247 was adopted into the state system in 1972, uh, I, and there has been some talk about the uh, highway having been realigned at some point, that uh, 247 actually was straight east-west, uh, but our route adoption maps back in 1972 indicate that the highway has always had this curve there at Camp Rock Road. So zooming in, here you see the subject parcel, uh, 157 some odd acres. Uh, it's undeveloped, uninhabited, and zoned agricultural. The department is seeking 1.3 acres in fee. This project will improve safety by reducing the number and severity of runoff the road type collisions uh, for this segment of highway. It was initiated due to the high number of these type of collisions uh, in this uh, section of roadway. During one study period, we had up to 77% of the accidents in this area were runoff the road type accidents. Uh, please keep in mind, though, the number of accidents isn't the only indicator of where a project is needed. It's also the type, the severity, and, of course, uh, followed by a, a full uh, analysis. 
So that's why we've initiated this project. Uh, the project proposes to widen the shoulders to a standard of eight feet and add rumble strips in the median or on the center lane and on the shoulders as well. Let's, uh, we will also improve the intersection slightly uh, to facilitate truck turning movement due to the large number of trucks that use this uh, road for the Mitsubishi Concrete Facility, which is south on Camp Rock Road. So zooming in a little bit closer here, again, the proposed project is in blue. We're seeking the uh, 1.3 acres in fee. Now, the property owners contended that there are a number of collisions at the intersection due to the curvature and due to the angle of the intersection. Um, the angle of the intersection is 78 degrees. The minimum is 75, so we are within standard for this intersection. Uh, the property owner has uh, proposed that we realign the highway. You can see the proposed realignment is in light blue there. Um, our proposed, of course, is in the dark blue. Now, I acknowledge this isn't an engineered solution, but I can tell you that it has uh, the following impacts. Uh, longer work limits. It would delay the start of this safety project two and a half to three years. Uh, longer construction schedule. Increased cost. We'd impact utilities that we are currently avoiding. Uh, while it does square up the intersection, uh, it does replace one large sweeping curve with three back-to-back -back tighter curves. Uh, this is a high-speed area. The, it's posted at 55 miles an hour. The big hit here is environmentally. This is the habitat of the endangered desert tortoise. Uh, our current project as proposed is already in an area that is disturbed, so we are actually have an environmental uh, categorical exclusion. In other words, we're not impacting any any habitat the proposed project would um, plow right through uh, new habitat um, this would require all new environmental studies uh, let's see which would take at least 24 months uh, require new permits and likely require environmental mitigation which which we aren't uh, doing with the proposed project um, it also increases the right of way required for the project so uh, we are currently asking 1.3 acres from the Mayhew parcel. The proposed would take two acres. And on the adjacent uh, property, Big Bear Regional Wastewater Agency, we're currently seeking 1.68 acres. That is under contract. Uh, the proposed would be uh, three acres. So quite a bit of additional right of way would be required for that proposal. We have had extensive meetings with the property owner since about this time last year. Um, we will continue to meet. We even, uh, Mr. Mayhew, thank you, came th this morning, and we uh, met down in the lobby to try to avoid coming to you today. But at this point, we aren't able to come to agreement. So related to the findings of the commission, the property owner contends that the project isn't necessary, the vehicles can safely maneuver onto the adjacent desert, um, and that if this was truly a safety project, we would include a longer strip of road. The department's response is that this is a safety project. Up to 77% of the collisions in this area are runoff the road type collisions. Uh, the project is part of the statewide, uh, statewide roadway departure safety Im implementation plan, and the project will reduce the number and severity of runoff the road type collisions. The project provides the additional shoulders so errant drivers can correct and provides the rumble strips to alert drivers when they are leaving their lanes. Next, uh, the department's position is that fast moving vehicles are safest when kept on pavement. This is not clear desert. There are utility poles, sign poles, there are is uneven terrain, brush, ditches, and other obstacles. It's not an acceptable safety strategy for us to allow cars at 55 miles an hour to, to roll, off, roll off the highway. And finally, this isn't uh, an isolated project. There are other safety projects very similar in this area. We just completed two 10-mile segments down near Yucca Valley of similar improvements. And there is a 56-and-a-half-mile project that will go this fall uh, that uh, includes similar type safety features. Next, the property owner contends that he has CHP collision data from 2014 to 2017. The collisions are at the intersection. The angled intersection is a problem, and we should add left turn lanes. The department's response is, we get our information from the Traffic Accident Surveillance and Analysis System, also known as TASIS. It is a comprehensive data set that includes both CHP data and local law enforcement as well. 
We've also completed a comprehensive data analysis and concluded that shoulders and rumble strips will improve safety, uh, and these are critical to meeting the project purpose and need. Next, the skew angle, uh, it does meet our standard. We're within standards for the skew angle. It's 78 degrees, the minimum is 75. And currently, the uh, intersection doesn't meet the uh, criteria to add left turn pockets. In essence, you'd have to have a heck of a lot more traffic out there and a large portion of that traffic making left turns before we would consider adding left turn pockets. Next, the project property owner contends that the project will acquire all his land north of the highway, eliminating some commercial opportunities and proposed his concept realignment. Uh, the department's response is the proposed realignment uh, has si significant environmental impacts, increases right of way, uh, impacts utilities we're currently avoiding, uh, replaces one large curve with three tight curves, delays construction, and uh, would increase cost and schedule. Next, the property owner contends that the project goals can be accomplished without the increased shoulders, that rumble strips don't increase safety. Uh, the department's response is that the paver wa paved wide shoulders allow errant drivers to correct and uh, the rumble strips provide an alert when drivers are departing their lane. So in sum summary, the public interest and necessity require the proposed project. The project is planned and located in a manner most compatible with greatest public good and least private injury. The property sought to be condemned is necessary and an offer of just compensation has been made. So the department requests your approval, and Director uh, Belinsky and I are here, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do we have another speaker on this item? Is the property owner representative here? Okay. My name is Jeff Bayhew. I am representing the property owner, and I'm part owner of the property. And thank you all for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Appreciate it. Um, you know, we've gone over the criteria, what's necessary. And, you know, based on our analysis, I think that when you weigh public interest and the taking of our property, it's really not there. Um, let me give you an overview. and. I don't know if, if there's a way to put this on the screen, but I know I gave copies to everybody. Is there a way for me to put this on the screen or is it? Okay. Exhibit A shows how the road was reconfigured. You know, we got the property, my family did around 1979, 1980. And, you know, at that time we had a survey done for title purposes and that survey, which is Exhibit B, shows that the road was straight at that time. Sometime, since then, you know, it's been moved. I don't know how it got moved, when it got moved. Our best guess, based on uh, talking to the locals, is somewhere in the early 90s. And, you know, the reason we pin it there, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, I remember it was done. But there was one woman who grew up about four blocks from this. Or I guess there really aren't blocks there. Maybe it's closer to like a quarter of a mile. And she said that when she's a teenager, it was that's when it was redone. And she happens to be 35 years old. So that puts it around the mid 90s. But in any event, uh, Caltrans took it over in 72. Caltrans says they have no records of doing this uh, this road realignment. But in essence, what this alignment did, and this is Exhibit C, if you look at it, it made a very, very narrow, uh, it could be sharp angle. You know, I had figured it at 75, they calculated it at 78. Don't know about standards, all I know is the practical impact of it when I look at it. And you will see there are lots of trucks that are constantly turning left and they can't do it because of that angle. In addition, and we'll, I'll go through this in greater depth, there's a sign that was left from the previous configuration that's still being used and it also confuses people. If you look at Exhibit D, you can sort of see how it was configured. They, to, sa to save money, they pushed it in between the utility lines, and so that's the reason for the curve at that point. Now, wh what does this mean? 
we've got a safety project that they feel is going to add safety to the to this and what they're doing is they're trying to tre create uh, the symptoms not the cause and they're doing it on faulty data I'll get to, I'll get to the data in a little bit but I want to just give an overview the two things that are that I think are causing the safety issues if there are any here are the the left turn the extreme sharp left turn that these concrete trucks have to make going to the Mitsubishi cement factory and number two the way that the sign is placed on the wrong side of the road after the curve not before the curve that confuses drivers but let's go ahead and first and, and I'd like to address the safety issue uh, can be the, the statistics when I had the two meetings with Caltrans they said they really couldn't provide the statistics to me and that they couldn't arrange to give me the uh, statistics that they had and so you know I question why are you using statistics that are you know five years old to determine what's wrong and what's right in this thing and they said well it just is and they didn't really have any answers for me they're just showing me that 77 percent are run off the road accidents and yet I didn't really see it from the statistics so I went to the only source that I knew the highway patrol which in this desert area if it doesn't uh, handle all of the incidents it certainly handles the vast majority of them and I did it for a four-year period from 2014 to 2017 and I went through and I took every you know it's a, it's a large database as you can imagine for South San Bernardino County I narrowed it down to the county I narrowed it down to anything on Highway 247 which stretches from Barstow to Yucca Valley I then narrowed it down to anything on Camp Rock Road I then went and looked at each incident and these are the only incidents that were within this parameter of it and that is on Exhibit E if you can see here we have one two three four five six seven instances of accidents in the last four years the first one alcohol related it's not even near the intersection number two unsafe entry or turn probably I don't know exactly what happened but they're probably trying to go on the side and turn around again not related to the intersection number three the unsafe and entry and turn they hit something probably on the side of the road because they were they were doing something but it was nothing to do with the intersection so let's go down to the ones that um, deal with the intersection which are on the far right number one it was at 1 a.m. in the morning alcohol related I'm not sure if rumble strips strips would help that it was collision with a fixed object sounds like they ran off the road yeah, so that is a potential run off the road instance what caused it, it looks like alcohol number two you can see that didn't stop at the stop sign number three unsafe entry term collision with another object didn't yield right away all of this all of these three are right there going north on Camp Rock Road now why is that important where it is because going north on Camp Rock Road is where the big concrete trucks turn left to go south on Camp Rock Road and it crosses over the lane and just I'm going to skip ahead for one second and come back to the statistics but if you look at exhibit F that was a that was actually a picture that I was able to I'm not a very good photographer but that was one that I was able to click right at the right moment but I took a lot of videos and stuff like that and this is a constant thing that you see that the trucks are turning left on the Camp Rock Road going south to get to the Mitsubishi plant if you notice the um, the map that they had before on there um, the Mitsubishi plant is at the end of Camp Rock Road what could be it's on Highway 118 near the end of Camp Rock Road this is the best way for somebody to get there who's coming from the east from Yucca Valley from Johnson Springs anywhere on the east and if you go quickly to exhibit G you'll notice even from the aerial you can see the constant rubber marks of cars turning across that lane why are they turning across the lane again the angle was made too sharp when the road was realigned it may be quote you know acceptable angle but when you have these large concrete trucks these large cement trucks like in like the picture in exhibit F you know it just doesn't quite work the same as it would if you have a car or even smaller trucks these are huge trucks that are there constantly it's just this particular road has those huge trucks 
Now, other places may not have it. Maybe the angle works there, but it doesn't seem to work here. And that's the proof. So when you're looking at these stats, you see that, first of all, you don't have a lot. It doesn't look like they're real runoff the road instances at the intersection. It looks like they're incursions from left turn lanes and run off the road intersection way away from the intersection. Okay. Now Caltrans, you know, showed a showed a couple of maps up there. And I just want to let you know the maps that they had weren't really correct because the first one if you saw showed that our our property was squared off. And that's the way it used to be. You know, their own map that they brought for the presentation showed our property squared off. Then the next one showed that a corner was cut off. Um, there's been no consistency on, on this. And as a result, we don't really know what, what is there, what's not there. Um, we haven't really, tr I haven't really tried to delay this because normal, in normal circumstances, I would just say, hey, you know what? Caltrans needs it for a project. This sounds like a good idea. But when I started looking at it, I didn't think it accomplished it, accomplished anything. Um, I wish my eyes were better so I could read my notes a little bit better. But um, Okay. So we've we've talked about the left curve, the left turn angle. The exhibit H shows what is needed. You know, at the very least, you should have a left turn lane on the to the on the for traffic heading westbound on Highway 247, or at least have enough area around there so that the trucks can turn left. That would make, that would mean making the intersection a little bit wider at that, ang at that angle. But making, but adding, at, but th the project as planned does nothing to do this. It doesn't address the intersection per se. It just, again, make, you know, runs it along a, about a mile strip of our property with, um, with wider, you know, wider, um, wider, mar um, excuse me, um, <laughs> wider uh, shoulders and it doesn't address the cause of the problem, the fact of the left turn lanes. Um, unfortunately for us, by doing it, it takes away from, you know, our, our property that we have on the uh, corner. And we've had Caltrans say, well, why do you need two corner properties? You know, isn't one corner enough? And I responded saying, well, it's like having two kids. Which one are you going to choose? You want to have, you, you know, as a landowner, if you're if you have a property you you want to be able to keep it you want to be able to utilize it for something and that's what we have the ability to do now this project takes that so let's let's look at the the issue of the sign causing these um, the improper placement of the sign if you look at this exhibit I you know the sign is on the wrong side of the road why is that if you look back at the way the road used to be config uh, configured in Exhibit A. The intersection was the, where it cut off was right past Camp Rock Road. So that sign was in a perfect location back then. Now it's on, it's on the wrong side of the road. They haven't bothered to move it. Um, and it's, it really causes confusion. You know, when, we, when I met with Caltrans, at first, they said it wasn't going to be a, they didn't see it as a problem. Then in the second review meeting said they were going to move it. They agreed with me that it was a problem and that would help things. And then I got a letter saying, well, we possibly, we talked about possibly moving it, but we decide not to, we don't need to. So they're back and forth on this. If you look at exhibit J, this is another view of it. Again, right before Camp Rock Road. And you can see as you come there, you know, in, as you, if you're looking at this in the desert sky, you look like you should maybe be going straight. 
or at night because you see the road and you expect you see the sign you expect on the right side exhibit K shows us even better as you're driving down there all of a sudden the road veers and the signs on the wrong side again confusing these are the little things that they're if you really try to prevent run off the road accidents these are the things you should be addressing first these are the th if you haven't addressed this you're gonna you're, you're gonna have the same issues whether you have rumble strips or not all you're doing you're not creating the cure that was one of the reasons why I suggested straightening the road not because I really like giving more property up but I think that's the larger that's the right way to do it as I've said before at some point in time it's going to be done that way and so we're going to lose it's going to be a a haphazard solution now that, that loses our corner and then we're going to have to give up more land anyway so I, I just if that's probably the best way to do it but if you're going to if you're going to put a, a million dollars in a project and take somebody's land you have to weigh it and I think you, if you look at exhibit L this is the first step that should be done move the sign to the proper location move it before the curve look how much look how much clearer it is between exhibit K and exhibit L it's just easier it's easier to see it allows every, people to more clearly know where the road is going and where they where they have to go if they want to go to Yucca Valley 29 Palms and Landers that's what you that's the way to do it so as a result I just don't think what they're proposing isn't going to really improve anything you don't have the safety data it's not you don't have the data that shows that anything's needed at the corner common sense and observation tells you that there's a sharp left turn that's causing a lot of the issues supported by whatever safety data has is there and number two the fact that people are confused by that sign going and that's potential run off the road I would do that before I would take somebody's land especially somebody taking an entire corner of somebody's land I just don't think that um, given the balancing act it's it's a necessary taking I just um, yeah don't think I don't think it's necessary to take our land because the project really only requires you know doing the things that I suggested thank you thank you do we have any questions for the property donor discussion on this matter hearing none do we have a motion any further no question no discussion do we have a motion yes Commissioner Burke excuse me you have to pull down your microphone hold it okay is there a real problem in I'd like to ask uh, okay. uh, a question yes, is, Commissioner. is there a real problem in moving the sign and yep. if you if this project goes through will the sign be placed uh, in right, a, an appropriate right. place right now um, we there was some waffling back and forth just looking at some pictures we had our operations folks come out and take a look at it in the field the sign as it stands currently meets guidelines now we can always do better and um, we can certainly look at it but uh, as the sign is placed now it doesn't violate any of our standards um, but of course like I said we can always do better and we will certainly look at that Commissioner Gometti while you're up there um, they gave us exhibit F it shows a photo of uh, a, a large cement truck making a left turn um, is is what the department doing gonna gonna alleviate the fact that the truck driver has to go over into the far right lane it, in order it to is, make, it make will the be turn. In, it will be enlarging the intersection slightly so it shouldn't be as exaggerated I can't say that we're gonna uh, totally eliminate that because it depends on the types of trucks sometimes they're dual sometimes they're singles things like that but um, we certainly were uh, because of the widened shoulders the intersection will have more room so trucks should have will have more room to maneuver yeah because looking at this it looks like an unsafe turn when you look at it I, I realize there's not a lot of traffic on this road out in this part so that the, is absolutely true do 
Do we have a motion? I move staff recommendation. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Arp, a second by Commissioner Medaffer. Any discussion? All in favor? Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on, item number four. Thank you, Commissioner. Number four is also a resolution of necessity appearance. We will stipulate the legal introduction is the same as that of the prior resolution of necessity. The Commission scheduled this condemnation appearance at the request of Attorney John Dietrich, representing property owner Saddleback Valley Unified School District. This appearance relates to impacts caused by a $137 million multi-funded <coughs> I-5 widening project in Orange County. The impacted property is 50.77 acres in size. The department needs 0 0.29 acres in fee, a 0 0.09 acre maintenance access easement, a 0 0.18 acre utility easement in favor of San Diego Gas and Electric Company, and a 0 0.05 acre temporary construction easement. Mike Whiteside, the department's assistant chief engineer, is ready to make the department's presentation to be followed by the school district's representative. Thank you, Terry, and good afternoon again. For the record, Mike Whiteside, Assistant Chief Engineer. Uh, we ask for your approval of this resolution for improvements to Interstate 5, District 12, Orange County. The property is owned by the Saddleback Valley Unified School District and is the campus of Mission Viejo High School. The project is located in southern Orange County uh, in the city of Mission Viejo on the border with Laguna Hills. There are 23 parcels necessary for the project. Uh, we only have two left to clear, this one and another that is on consent later. This project is the second of three segments of a larger project. Uh, the total length is 6.5 miles. The project is sponsored by OCTA in partnership with Caltrans and the cities of Mission Viejo, Laguna Hills, Lake Forest, and Laguna Niguel. Uh, it's funded by county measure money and STIP funds. The purpose is to reduce congestion and improve, uh, improve operations. It will add one mixed flow in each direction, uh, add auxiliary lanes, and improve on and off ramps. So here you see the uh, Mission Viejo High School uh, campus is outlined in green with its various facilities, pools, stadium, a uh, couple of baseball diamonds. Uh, blue here represents the proposed project. We're seeking 0.29 acres in fee, 0.18 acres in an underground utility easement, 0.09 acres in a maintenance easement, 0.03 acres in a temporary construction easement for a period of four months, and finally a 0 0.02 acre uh, temporary construction easement for the duration of the project. So zooming in to the affected area, 0.29 acres in fee, 0.18 acres in an underground utility easement. Now it looks like it's hanging out there. I'm gonna explain that a little bit more in a bit. Um, this is to replace an existing aerial power line that, uh, and that has an existing easement and we're undergrounding and rerouting that power line. We have 0.09 main acres maintenance easement. Uh, this is to inspect our facilities at least annually and to do graffiti removal. Access will be on foot and this doesn't impact any of the school facilities. Uh, normally these uh, maintenance easements are 15 feet wide. We've narrowed that to 10 to minimize impacts. Then we have 0 0.03 acres in a temporary construction easement for four months and 0 0.02 acres in a temporary construction easement for the duration. Uh, these are needed to move contractors, materials, and people around and machinery. Uh, again, usually these are 10 foot wide. We've narrowed that to three, again, to minimize impacts to the school. Uh, any, any school facilities in that temporary construction easement will be protected in place and the area would be restored to as is or better condition uh, when construction is complete. Uh, security, of course, is always a concern and obviously because of this location. Uh, so regarding the temporary construction easements, we plan right now to secure them with fencing and privacy screening. We have asked the school district if they'd like additional security measures. Uh, they have yet to tell us what those might be. So very briefly about the utility easement, the red lines here indicate an existing power line. The lower two legs in solid are overhead area lines. The dashed upper leg is an existing underground uh, power line. 
So widening in this area removes the power for the poles or the, the space for the poles. So we're proposing to reroute this uh, electric line um, and underground it. So the routing was discussed in June of 2016 with the maintenance operations and construction manager and the assistant principal of business and facilities. It was one of several options that were discussed and the one that we found that we agreed would be the least disruptive. Um, to minimize impacts to the fields, we're using directional drilling to avoid trenching. Uh, we've limited the construction to 25 days and we've offered to do that construction in a period when the school indicates it would be least impactful to their operations. Um, of course, we can't say there will be no impacts to their operations. There will be, but we're offering to do the work uh, at a time when it would minimize impacts to their operations. So a little bit about maintenance here. Uh, paralleling the Metrolink tracks is La Paz channel that goes under the highway. Caltrans has to maintain that channel to prevent blockages. Otherwise, we may flood the Metrolink tracks. Currently, access is from the shoulder. Uh, the widening, shown here in blue, uh, takes that space. So we have to relocate the maintenance access. So we've done so at the bottom of this picture. Uh, but that is very narrow and we have to uh, have a turnaround for the vehicles so that's this upper hammerhead area is an area for the trucks to pull in and turn around and exit safely the school has not objected to this portion of the fee acquisition as it's outside their fence line it's on a slope and they don't they don't use the uh, don't use the space uh, the objection comes to this area here that parallels the highway and so I'll go into a little bit of detail there. I would say to minimize impacts uh, in that particular area, we're limiting construction to four months, uh, a four month construction window. The, the total project I think is something like five years, but we're limiting construction in that, that area to four months. Um, again, we've offered to do that construction at a period when it would be least impactful to the school operations. Uh, but that time frame, uh, that period, that four month period has not been uh, indicated. So let's zoom in really quickly here. Uh, here you see the impacted area. The school has a bullpen in the area, portable storage shed, a dugout, uh, two portable bleachers, and a backstop. And here you see our fee acquisition in yellow. Uh, we don't, this does not touch any of the school facilities. We have our maintenance easement. Again, this is an area we would just access by foot and walk around. It does not, it will not impact any of the school facilities. And then we have our temporary construction easement. We do touch one, a little bit of the bullpen um, in that one, but that would be protected in place and restored to original condition afterwards. Um, so I'm gonna give you an idealized version. This is kind of the worst case scenario along the whole length. You see the existing sound wall and the existing chain link pen uh, bullpen. We're proposing a retaining wall and a sound wall. The yellow is this, in this area, it's 16 foot acquisition. In much of the area, it's only a two foot narrow strip of acquisition. And then we have, again, our maintenance easement where we walk around to inspect our walls to make sure they're performing adequately and to remove graffiti. And we would do so at a time that was uh, not impactful to the school facilities. And finally, we have our temporary construction easement. And that does touch that corner of the bullpen. So let me give you a, a real view, view of what that looks like. Here you see the bullpen our acquisition area in yellow, our maintenance easement uh, for inspecting our facilities, and the temporary construction easement. And finally, that's about what our wall would look like. So uh, since we began discussion uh, last year and made our first offer, uh, the school district has indicated that uh, our construction, they feel, would require relocation of the entire baseball diamond, shifting it about 15 feet to the north. Um, we disagree. We don't feel we are touching their facilities to such an extent. Uh, we're not saying that we're not impacting them. We're just saying that we can minimize and um, we don't feel that it, it m requires the relocation of the field. But I would say that this completely falls in the area of compensation. We would not relocate the field, obviously. It would be a, an issue with us uh, in the acquisition, uh, what the damages are and how we would uh, make them whole. So uh, we have tried to minimize impacts to the project. Uh, if you see now in the orange is what a full standard ramp would look like. We have several geometric exceptions. We've reduced easement widths. We've limited the time of construction. Um, and so that translates into our design as proposed. And we're avoiding about 1.19 acres of the school property. 
Again, we've also offered to limited construction work uh, to durations that would be least impactful and for construction periods, uh, very short, for shortened construction periods. We are limited in this area to what we can do as non-standard. Uh, due to the stopping site distance, we have to maintain adequate storage, and we don't want to impact the channel or the railroad here. Uh, if we impact the channel, then we suddenly have all kinds of environmental concerns, of course, to deal with. So we have, again, had extensive contacts with the property owners since uh, really started in February of 2014 during the environmental process, and we have met several times in 2017 and 2018. Uh, even if you grant this round, we will continue to strive to come to agreement. Uh, and uh, we did even, again, meet this morning in an effort to be able to avoid coming to you. So related to the findings of the commission, the property owner contends that for all fee acquisitions, uh, or fault for all acquisitions, fee and easements, the departments failed to identify the property sought, the impacts, the type of work, and the timing of that work. The department's response is that was provided, presented, and has been discussed several times over the last, uh, since September of 2017. Um, the, uh, the appraisal report provides the rights acquired, gives the legal descriptions of all the acquisitions, provides appraisal maps, and uh, describes all the impacts to each parcel. In addition, we have staked the site so that the facilities, the impacts could be seen in context, and we have walked the site with school officials uh, at least two, I think maybe even three times now. Related to the uh, findings, uh, the property owner contends the Caltrans, can Caltrans deviate from our design standards to limit impacts? As I described earlier, we have done so to the greatest extent we feel possible. Not only uh, have we limited the physical uh, uh, design, we've also minimized our easements we, and we've limited our construction cons uh, periods. Finally, uh, the property owner contends no offer based on the appraised value of the property has been made and we failed to assess the severance damages. The department's response is that we've made the initial offer in September of 2017. We revised it in 2018. That was minor due to uh, an, an additional easement we needed and uh, our offers are in compliance with government code. Uh, at this point, everything we're discussing uh, that is in contention is a compensation issue. So with that, the public interest and necessity require the proposed project. The project is planned and located in a manner most compatible with greatest public good and least private injury. The property sought to be condemned is necessary and an offer has been made. So the department requests your approval of this resolution and uh, now the district 12 director and I are here and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We do have one speaker, John Dietrichs from Saddleby Valley Unified School District. Good afternoon. I have a, a written document and have 18 copies of it for the, uh, the members of the commission and uh, would like to have this made part of the record. My name is John Dietrich. I'm a partner with the firm Atkinson Andelson, Lawyer Rudin Romo, and we represent Saddleback Valley Unified School District. The district opposes the uh, resolution of necessity that's before the commission today. We believe that the acquisition will necessarily cause the district to have to reconfigure its fields, and we believe the severance analysis, which was done by the appraiser, is flawed. The, uh, the severance analysis essentially looks at um, the, uh, the, the taking and concludes there's gonna be no impacts on the fields and no impacts on the use of the fields and that's just simply wrong. You're going to be uh, tearing down a sound wall and going ahead and reconstructing a new retaining wall and sound wall adjacent to one of the districts, uh, the Mission Viejo High School's baseball field. There's no way that the, the um, school is going to be able to use that field and um, during, certainly during construction, but even, even in the after condition, if you look at how close the wall is now to the facilities. So the district has to shift those facilities. And so as a result, the district believes the severance um, analysis 
was incorrectly performed and was actually, if you check closely the appraisal, it was based upon instructions from the project designer that there wouldn't be impacts on the field and it wouldn't impact the, the district's use of the fields. So as a result, the uh, offer under government code section 7267.2 was flawed. And as a result, making a finding that the offer has been made is not a correct finding. In addition, in looking at the, uh, the notice for uh, today's hearing, yes, there were three things which were stated in the notice. The public interest and necessity require the project. The project is planned or located in a manner that will be most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury. And finally, that the property sought to be acquired is necessary for the project. Those are the same findings which uh, staff has, has uh, provided information to you about. Well, we certainly disagree that the project is planned and located in a manner that's most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury. And we have repeatedly suggested that if the alignment change in the wall is moved just a little bit north, we can avoid the impacts to Mission Viejo High School's fields completely. But when I received the draft resolution and reviewed the draft resolution that's before the commission today, it included two additional findings which there's been no data that's been provided. A and these findings are quite interesting. The first finding is that the taking that's proposed is compatible with the present use of the property. Mission Viejo High School has been located and, and educating students since 1965. And saying that um, taking a piece of the athletic fields for highway purposes is a compatible taking, that's just simply incorrect. In addition, um, Caltrans is well aware that this property is already put to a public use. And that's important because when taking property which has already been put to a public use, there must be a showing and a finding that the taking is a more necessary public use than the public use for which the property has already been put. Uh, and is already used for. And interestingly, in looking at the draft resolution which was, uh, was to be considered, that finding is in there. However, there's no evidence that's been presented showing that the use for which Caltrans is taking the proposed property um, is a more necessary public use. And the district certainly doesn't agree that taking the property so that you can build an on, uh, on or off ramp to expand the freeway is a more necessary public use than its use of the property as a high school. And so as a result, the district urges the commission to not approve the resolution of necessity and go back and undertake the necessary steps in order to perfect this acquisition. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Do we have any questions from the commission? Commissioner Gilmetti. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, I'm with, with Caltrans. I, I guess I don't understand. I, look, I'm in the construction business, and I realize that construction schedules don't always come out exactly on time. And, um, you know, the baseball season is going to be out there for three or four months. Um, there are two things that bother me. One, there, you're, you're going to underground the utilities that goes directly under the ball field. Um, so you're going to have to dig all that up. Um, secondly, you, you, you've really kind of squeezed the field down. Um, uh, the bullpen now basically is up against, <coughs> up against the future sound wall. There seems to me plenty of room to move the field. I guess it's in the eastern direction. Probably would help the, the left-handed hitters because it would shorten the field <laughs> up a little bit. Um, but I, I don't know why that wasn't really a strong consideration of the department to um, just go ahead and work with the district and shift the field uh, to the east. Um, well, I want to back up a little bit. Uh, for the undergrounding of the utility, we're using what's called directional drilling. So we won't be trenching into the field, okay? Um, they just they will dig a pit and then put a drill bit through that is guided and then they meet their spot. That doesn't mean, again, that there isn't any impact from that, but we're not 
digging a, a, an eight foot trench down the center of the field. Well, so do you have an estimate of timing to get that? Yes, that, 25 that? days. 25, 25 days? Day. We limit it to 25 days uh, from end to end. This would be done by the utility company. It's not designed by Caltrans. But um, we, and we chose, we asked the school when that would be least impactful to their field operations. Again, I said least impactful, not non-impactful. Um, and about the relocation of the bullpen, we're certainly open to that discussion, but again, this falls into the area of, of compensation. Um, we're not experts on bullpens. Um, they would, they, we would pay them to relocate their facilities. I, I don't want to bring up compensation. That's not our issue. I, but my question is more directly directed at, at, at working with the school district and moving the field. I, and I, I'm, I'm assuming it's in an easterly direction. Uh, we're certainly open to discussing that, but again, we, we've modified the design to the greatest extent possible to try and minimize the impacts. And at this point, it's, it's kind of a he said, he said. We're saying we don't think that we're being that impactful to school. They're saying we are. We need to go to the next level here, move it to the next phase, which would be um, we've, we're discussing mediation and other things to move it along and make sure that the school district is made whole due to the appropriately made whole uh, uh, due to our project. Well, maybe our next question should be with the school district, if you could come back up. If you could work out something with, with uh, the department to move move that field in that easterly direction, is, is that going to satisfy all the school district's re requests and needs? I'm not certain of that, um, quite honestly. Uh, that is certainly one way to accommodate the project. But I don't think it cures the flaws which were identified. You know, you're here today to adopt a resolution of necessity to take real property that's owned by the school district. And the commission needs to be mindful of taking all the appropriate legal steps relative to that. The severance analysis was not properly done. In fact, the appraiser was instructed that the fields wouldn't be affected. Well, if you look at the project, the fields are absolutely going to be affected. That's why I'm bringing up the question. So uh, we're not getting this. This commission cannot get into compensation. Uh, I, I agree with you, and so that's, that's why I'm my, not saying my, it's a compensation. My issue. question is: I know you represent the school district. I don't know if the school district is here, but is, is that going to satisfy the problem if you move the field? If the if the district agrees to move the field, does that satisfy? your problem moving the field will be part of the problem that during construction of this project the field is going to be rendered unusable in any event because of the fact that you're going to have um, a sound wall demolished and you're going to have another sound wall and retaining wall being built so using the field during that time period isn't going to be possible okay look I'm, as I said before I'm in construction all right you can move the field prior to the district starting any of their work I agree with that and if we move the field prior to the start of the work that would cure um, potentially the field use issue so that issue goes away it could potentially yes <laughs> this is like pulling teeth um, <laughs> where <coughs> you know we've done this before uh, madam chair Maybe we can send the parties out into the hallway and, and come back and, and see if they can't resolve this issue uh, and not take up any more time right now. Well, what's ended up happening here? And it frustrates us to no end. You know, it, there's some room for movement on both sides. Both of you are in a corner right now. You gotta come out of the corner. You know, we don't, <laughs> when, this isn't a court of law. So the minutia of they did this not to the dotting the I's and crossing the T's, that doesn't help us get to a deal. So what I, we'd like for you guys to do, go out in the hallway, come back to us with a solution. Because pretty much, and I, and I think I've said this before, if we have to make this decision, neither one of you are going to like what we're going to do. I understand. So if we can walk out into the hallway, put your issues in a bucket for right now, and try to come to a solution, and you guys got to move too, and you're not completely innocent in this thing. So if, if you would do us just a favor, going out in the hallway, taking about 30 minutes, put everything, you know, put all your prejudices in a bucket, 
and come back in here with a deal, then that would make this whole thing easier. We, we would be happy to uh, speak out in the hall with uh, Caltrans staff. Thank you. I have a couple of questions in that regard. I, I think there's bullpens in a lot of different locations. I've been to enough baseball games in my day, so I'm not sure we're talking about relocating a whole field versus a bullpen. So I think we need to really be open, as Commissioner Alvarado said, to all the solution. It behooves all of us to work together and find a solution. But this is uh, JV bas baseball field, I believe. I, I don't think it's the varsity field, and I think that within all of us giving in the spirit of working it out let's let's see what what the real question is i do have one technical question uh that i've asked caltrans going to ask for the record to make sure in working with the client's demands and we made some geometric exceptions we did not create any safety hazards in any way did we the very brief answer is no. The reason we were able, though, to compromise um, and go non-standard on so many features to minimize the impacts was that the proposed closely mimics the alignment that's out there, and that has proven to be uh, not uh, a problem. So we were able to uh, compromise on the new and, and uh, get so many exceptions. You know, and, and just to kind of alleviate the pain of this whole thing, you know, this, this can't be the only baseball field in town. Well, you know, you know and, we and should we should accommodate the, the baseball team if there's another ball field in town, rent the damn baseball field for the season and get this thing done instead of dragging it out over at four months at a time. Uh, there's got to be a solution here. Well, and I'm, there is, Commissioner, but and we're happy to look at uh, he, my compatriot here brought up severance damages. That's again a compensation issue, and if they have to go out and rent ad additional fields. Uh, then that's fine. We would compensate them for that if that's what is determined necessary. Okay, well, we all know we don't do compensation. Von Kuninenberg, did you have a comment? We're good? Yeah. Commissioner, I just, Commissioner Arp. Just one final question. Do you have the authority to make a final decision for the school today? No, that would have to go before the district's Board of Education to make a final decision. They could come up with a proposal that uh, if we give them a half hour and they come back with some kind of a reasonable proportion, pro I suspect the board would accept it. Well, certainly, if we come up with a proposal that I would recommend to the board, I would expect that the board um, would look favorably upon it. However, you know, the Board of Education um, ultimately runs the school district, and so I can't conclusively bind them today. So we'd have to really continue this in that, under those circumstances, right? Okay, well, in, unless, unless in order to get that. any kind of conclusion, we would have to. He has to go back to his board. We would be open to a continuance of this matter so that we could meet further and try to resolve the outstanding issues. You impact the construction season. You know, we it, the department's okay. position at this point is that it, these are all compensation issues. We'll, we'll be happy to go out and continue to talk, but we can't alter the design any further. Um, from here on out it's compensation okay I think it's I think it's clear to us that we don't have I, I parties that could get to an agreement so what's the pleasure of the Commission I move to to staff's recommendation we have a motion by Commissioner von Kneinenberg a second by Commissioner Badaffer any further discussion all in favor Aye. Aye. anybody opposed Gilmetti is opposed. Commissioner opposed for the record. Any abstentions for the record? Okay, motion carries. Moving on to item number five approval of the minutes. I have a motion by Commissioner Medaffer, a second by Commissioner Alvarado. All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? 
motion carries. I, I feel badly that there's so many people standing in the back. I think it's time to make a new friend. There are random seats around. Y'all just grab a seat. We're going to be here for a while, so settle in and make yourself comfortable. I think if we all look around, probably everybody who's standing can find a place to sit. Yeah. Commissioner Alvarado and I are sitting very close. Okay, <laughs> item number six. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve by Commissioner Alvarado, second by Commissioner Tavaloni. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Anybody abstain? I didn't ask. Let's go. Okay, item number seven. Executive Director Branson. Commissioners, uh, today I'm going to keep my remarks short uh, given the amount of um, participation we have in this meeting and the topics that we have on our agenda. I would just like to um, really acknowledge the Senate Rules Committee did uh, vote unanimously to confirm the reappointments of Commissioners Inman, Alvarado, and Van Koninenberg at their meeting. So that's wonderful. And uh, commissioners, we have filled some vacancies in the office, and I will not go into the detail of their backgrounds at this meeting, but I'll, I'll bring them to the June meeting for you to meet. But um, wanted to let you know that we have appointed a Deputy Director for Administration and Financial Management. Her name is Zilan Chin. We have appointed a Associate Government Programming Analyst. Ms. Branson, if, if the staff are here that you're introducing, uh, okay. Yes. I know commissioners will bring them in June. Uh, we were limiting the travel for this meeting. But um, I just want to make sure that actually our partners in the room too know who these new commission staff are because you may be hearing from them. We have Jennifer Valeris. Uh, she's an analyst. She'll be helping our, um, our technical staff as well as Alika Shingazi and she's a student assistant. So we will again bring them forward in June. Um, commissioners, uh, the commission did participate in a town hall meeting in Santa Rosa in April, and Garth Hopkins will provide a very short overview of that town hall meeting. Yes, commissioners. Uh, the Sonoma County Transportation Authority hosted the commission for a town hall meeting on April 11th and 12th in Santa Rosa. This town hall was unique in that Sonoma County also invited transportation representatives from Lake and Mendocino counties as well. During the meeting, uh, each of the three counties made presentations on major transportation issues relevant to their respective counties. One of the common themes presented by the counties was the toll sustained on local roads following the many fires that had devastated these counties over the past several years. The roads were impacted by the heavy equipment that was needed to clean up after those fires. The town hall also included a tour of the Sonoma Marin Area uh, Rail Transit or SMART and also uh, key transportation projects along the 101 corridor. Thank you, Garth. And, you know, just would like to extend our thanks to Suzanne Smith, Sonoma County Transportation Authority, Phil Dow of Mendocino, as well as Farhan Mansouri and Smart, um, and all the other uh, officials that helped to make this town hall possible. And, commissioners, as a reminder, we are holding a joint a meeting with the California Air Resources Board on June 27th. And um, for those of you in the room and viewing this, um, the meeting is to coincide with the June commission meeting. So the commission meeting is scheduled for June 27th and 28th. We're planning a, a possible morning meeting on Wednesday commission meeting, a joint CTC ARB meeting the afternoon of Wednesday, June 27th, and then a commission meeting on June 28th. And so we are looking forward to that. And then also as an action item from the last meeting, wanted to let you know that 11 letters were sent out to the bridge owners who uh, have shown little, little or no progress in the local bridge seismic retrofit program. These letters had called or are calling for the bridge owners to place a high priority to ensure that the work is completed for these bridges to ensure that they are seismically safe. Um, and again, this was an action item from the March meeting. And then commissioners, today on your agenda are uh, quite a few very important 
actions for the state uh, for you to consider approving. These would be uh, adopting the competitive programs in Senate Bill 1 that were made possible for uh, reducing congestion, improving our trade quarters, and improving our overall quality of life in the state. And um, I just um, also want to let you know with, with the actions to adopt these programs, that would mean that this commission this year has moved forward on adopting programs, various programs amounting to over $9 billion in Senate Bill 1 funding, directing that funding to projects and that are critical to the state and to um, really the nation. And I would also like to let you know that also on the agenda is the action to adopt guidelines for the next round of active transportation. And if you, you know, with your approval of those guidelines, it will also result in a call for projects for the active transportation program the next cycle. And we also have an amendment for the uh, accountability guidelines to ensure that the promises made by all of our partner agencies are kept. And with that, I just want to take the opportunity, I know there's a lot of actions to take place, but getting us to here where we are today would not have been possible without our amazing staff. And so I just really want to thank you all. So. I think we would add all of our congratulations, Susan, to you and your entire team. And uh, it's hard to imagine how many workshops, how many meetings, and you all make us proud. So thank you all for your hard, hard work. So with that, commission reports, fellow commissioners. Okay, then I'll jump in here. Uh, in my role as chair, I... Um, was asked to make committee appointments so I work with my fellow colleagues and these are the committee appointments that they've all graciously agreed to serve and I do appreciate that so Commissioner Tavaloni and von Kainberg the aeronautics committee Commissioner Burke and Gardino to the mass transit committee Commissioner Alvarado Gometti and Tavaloni to the streets and highway committee Commissioners Dunn, Arp, and Kehoe to the Planning Committee, and Commissioner Medaffer will continue serving on the Road Charge Technical Advisory Committee. So thank you to all of my fellow commissioners for uh, taking on those responsibilities, and I do appreciate all of the active, active engagement of all our commissioners. So any comments from the fellow commissioners? If not, we'll move on to item number eight. Uh, or nine, and that will be Secretary Annis. Sure. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, Executive Director Branson and I were at an event recently in the SCAG region, and I preceded her and stole her talking points, and she just got back at me just now. <laughs> but uh, I would be remiss if I, if I didn't really note the import of today, because we're uh, about 13 months from when uh, uh, Assembly Member Frazier and, and the legislature passed SB1 about 12 months beyond when the governor signed the bill and with the actions up on your agenda today we really complete cycle one of allocating all the funds for, for SB1 and it, it, it is momentous um, you know I want to certainly join uh, Susan in recognizing the CTC staff but also the commissioners on all your hard work uh, this really matched the schedule of Prop 1B to get uh, projects awarded within about a year. But here, this time, you had additional requirements for oversight, for accountability. Uh, you're, of course, uh, oversight of Caltrans and pre-construction phases. So a lot more work, but also want to recognize the Caltrans staff that uh, got the projects ready uh, to be uh, programmed, and as well as all the uh, partners in the audience here who had a lot of work to do to get projects ready and brought forward in both the formula and competitive programs. And of course, over this last year, uh, locals have brought forward over 4,000 local street and road projects for fixing potholes, repaving, making safety improvements to intersections. Uh, two years ago, of course, the STIP had to uh, deprogram or delay 1.5 billion of, of projects and the last uh, STIP adopted in April, or excuse me, in March, of course, uh, added about 3 billion in projects. Uh, the shop was adopted and adding about 6 billion due to, due to SB1 and here today 
uh, with the competitive programs, I believe the total under consideration is about $2.7 billion. So it's really a, a momentous thing. And the other thing that Susan alluded to as well is, uh, you know, we've already started cycle two. I understand the local street and road applications have been submitted for round two. And you'll get started on ATP. And I know all these competitive programs will uh, quickly get started again on, on guideline updates and so forth. So we're almost <laughs> well into round uh, two already. But just want to recognize all the work of everyone and thank everyone for, I think, really uh, keeping the promises of SB1 and, and bringing the projects forward that will so much improve our quality of life and, and the economy in California. Really see see the condition of roads get better, see the con uh, condition of congestion improve in, in some of the key corridors around the state. So thank you. Thank you, Secretary Annis. And next up on our agenda, we're going to hear from Director Berman, but I have to share a little extra factoid for you all. We actually have two birthdays on this dais today. So with that, I'll let you guess who one of them is, and the other one is to my immediate left, your right. So take it Happy away, birthday. Director Berman. As my mother would have said, keep your day jobs. That was lovely. Thank you. <laughs> and happy birthday, Susan. Um, and I also want to thank the commission for holding the May meeting in San Diego so I could be home for my birthday. Yay. Nice touch. <laughs> OK, so moving on, a few personnel changes to note. Stephen Keck, who's not going to look up while I talk about him sitting back there. You all know Stephen, and he has graciously agreed to be our new chief financial officer. So you'll still see, see, see Stephen, but in a slightly different role. I know you all know him, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. He has been, he's been with Caltrans for 18 years. He's been our chief budget officer since 2009, so he's been responsible for managing the department's $13 billion budget as well as cash management policy and revenue forecasting. He, and what you don't know about him is, I think what really helped him was he had a brief stint in his career in District 11, and I'm sure that set him on his way. Um, <laughs> today is not his birthday, so that's all I'm going to say about Stephen. Um, he is going to be replaced temporarily by Ron Shepard, and Ron has been in the budget's office. I'm trying to see. Ron has been the um, Act, he's been the division chief, I'm sorry, Ron has been the office chief for program operations and budget development and he's agreed to be acting as the budgets division chief until we can permanently fill that position. Also, Danny Yost has been appointed as Caltrans assistant deputy director for legislative affairs. Danny replaces Melanie Perrin, who was appointed as deputy secretary for legislation at, at California State Transportation Agency in late January. Danny has a background that includes both engineering and public policy, and he has served as a legislative liaison for Caltrans Ledge Affairs since 2012, so we're excited about that. Um, I want to talk to you about some other great things that our employees are doing. First of all, I'm happy to share that one of our employees from District 7 received a national award at the Careers and the Disabled Magazine 26th Annual Award Ceremony, which was held in Boston last month. Syed Amir, oh, I have a hard time with the name, Torabzadeh, Torabza he is a District 7 transportation engineer. He's working in the Traffic Accident Surveillance and Analysis System Unit, was the recipient of that national award. In addition to the work he does in, tra in traffic operations, Syed chairs the District 7 Disability, Disability Advisory Committee and led it to establish an annual scholarship program for students to attain higher education. He also serves on Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti's Advisory Committee for policy recommendations on parking accessibility. And the Orange County Engineering Council recognized his outstanding engineering service. 
He was one of only 10 outstanding employees nationwide who received this award in recognition of their professional and personal achievements. Caltrans was recognized along with representatives from NASA, AT&T, and LinkedIn. And I had a chance to meet with Syed last week in LA, and he's very inspiring. He talked about coming to this country and what it's meant to him to work at Caltrans and to be given the opportunities he's been given. So very proud of him. Tomorrow, unfortunately, I will not be here. You'll see Deputy Director Chamberlain here. I will be participating in this year's Governor's State Employee Medal of Valor Awards Ceremony, and I have the opportunity to present Medals of Valor to five of our District 3 employees in two separate incidents. Theodore Sampson, a transportation engineer who placed himself in harm's way to rescue an operator of a spider excavator during slide removal operations near Baxter on I-80 last winter. And then we had Jason Hines, Matthew McCarter, Sean Morgan, and Steve Ryan, who are Caltrans equipment operators, who rescued three people from an overturned car in the American River off Highway 50 last winter. There's a lot more to their stories, but it did involve them going in and trying to over, and I believe turning over a car that had overturned in the river and pulling people out of a car in the winter. Um, so that summary doesn't really do it justice, but I'm really proud to be leading an organization of employees who show so much bravery um, and do things that are really not part of their job description. So that's where I'll be tomorrow. <laughs> but wait, there's more. No. I, <laughs> I also want to thank uh, Executive Director Branson and Commissioners Tavaloni and Von Canine. I'm sorry, Commissioner Paul. <laughs> <laughs> who were in attendance for our 28th annual Workers Memorial at the State Capitol and Assembly Member Frazier who was there and spoke as well. I want to thank the entire Commission for your support over the years for this event. Thursday, April 26th, we honored the legacies of two Caltrans employees. Uh, there's actually been 188 total Caltrans employees who've lost their lives in the line of duty since 1921. This year we paid special tribute to C.C. Hahn and Annette Brooks. And CC was killed while collecting tolls at the Bay Bridge when a box truck collided with several other vehicles and her toll booth, toll booth on December 2nd, 2017. We also paid tribute to Annette Brooks, who was a steel structural painter supervisor. Annette was unfortunately shot and killed at a Caltrans facility in Rio Dell on April 24th, 2017. The Workers' Memorial is really an important way to help us remember our fallen colleagues and to keep their memories alive and recognize the tremendous loss that their families have suffered. It's also an opportunity for us to remind ourselves that it's our responsibility to keep our highway workers safe by slowing down, paying attention, and moving over when the amber la lights are flashing. And as we move ahead with a lot more construction um, as a result of SB1, I'm really trying to, and I hope you'll all join me, to remind the traveling public to slow down and, and give yourselves extra time. They're gonna be inconvenienced while all this work is going on. Last week, Ryan Chamberlain and I had the pleasure to conduct our first Caltrans Town Hall meeting in San Luis Obispo. It was a great opportunity to hear from the District 5 team, and I had the opportunity to answer their questions. We also took the time to recognize the department's overwhelming professionalism in response to the devastate, devastating fires and mudslides, as well as discuss ongoing leadership transitions and the effect that SB1 is having on our on our operations and talk about the importance of moving ahead and delivering projects. Um, Commissioner Gilmetti, I know at last, the last meeting you asked about the numbers for the slides in Santa Barbara County. The total amount for the emergency contracts and the maintenance activities was 30.5 million. I also had the opportunity the day before the town hall to tour some of the devastation that is still being repaired in Montecito where there's a lot of homes that are down and some bridges that are still closed. Well while we work towards repairing those. So now let's talk about money. Um, so on May 10th, 2018, Caltrans announced the recipients of 105 million in State of Good Repair or SD SGR program funds from SB1 money that will provide capital assistance to local governments and agencies to rehabilitate and modernize California's existing local transit systems. The program has a specific goal of keeping transit systems in a state of good repair, including the purchase of new transit vehicles and maintenance and rehab of transit facilities and vehicles. 
This program's investment will lead to cleaner transit vehicle fleets, increased reliability and safety, and reduced greenhouse gas emissions and other pollutants. The SGR funds are allocated under the State Transit Assistance Program formula to eligible agencies, half according to population and half according to operator revenues. Also, Caltrans just announced yesterday the next round of local transportation planning grants totaling $41 million. Local agencies will put this money to use for planning efforts and projects that support more sustainable communities, reduce transportation-related greenhouse gases, and adapt for the effects of climate change. Finally, I want to also add my thanks to the CTC staff for their efforts in providing their recommendations for the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program, Solutions for Congestion Corridors, and the Local Partnership Competitive Program. Um, we're looking forward to working closely with the Commission. I know that this has been a lot of work, um, but it's a really exciting day for all of us in the transportation world, so thank you to the CTC staff. And uh, Lori, I know it started with Malcolm, and, and uh, I've been whining about this, but I'm really proud and, and happy to say uh, congratulations. Uh, opening that third lane on the Richmond Centerfell Bridge sure made a lot of people happy and made my life a lot easier. <laughs> Are you, have you finished? Okay. That okay. concludes my report. Okay, thank you, Director Berman. Okay, next up, oh, guess no. who? Federal Highways is here. In the interest of time, because I know you have a lot on your agenda, I'm going to talk about nine things instead of five. Um, so our administrator, our uh, executive director, Butch Weidlick, is retiring, and we have an, a new uh, acting. Her name is uh, Cheryl Walker. She's been in our policy division uh, with Federal Highway. She's great. I've worked with her for a long time. Um, so she will be starting in, Butch will be ending at the end of uh, May, so she'll be starting in June. Um, we have no word on the infra grants at the moment, so we're still waiting on that. The the latest uh, omnibus bill that came out a while ago uh, talks a little bit about some of the funding. One of the things that I wanted to point out is they are doing the earmark repurposing again that we had done before. Uh, that happened a few years ago or over the last couple uh, appropriations, uh, the repurposing the earmarks. So they're going to look at any, any uh, earmarks that are older than uh, September 30th of 2007. Uh, so any earmark that's older than that and has less than 10% on it can be repurposed. Now, the big difference on this one than previously is that started at 50-mile radius, and then the next appropriation expanded it to a 100-mile radius, and this last omnibus shrunk it back down to a 50-mile radius. So it'll be a 50-mile radius uh, of where the original uh, earmark was done. And that, again, is, is a decision that the state and the locals will deal with. That's not a federal decision. All we will say is, is it... We, we're not going to get into what the project should be. We're going to get into does it meet that the criteria, and that's it. That's your guys' decision. Uh, I think it's a pretty well-established process on how that's worked in the past, so I think that'll be successful. Um, freight plan update. I know we've done a lot of work with Caltrans on that. I, I appreciate uh, Coco and her shop uh, getting that up. We're pretty close to where we're Fast Act compliant. Um, I know you guys have some actions here today that are going to affect later. Um, but there's been a lot of work that's put into that, and uh, so we're we're right there. So it's been a, a good a good working relationship that we've had with uh, Coco and her team. So thank you to her and her team. Um, before I get to my last thing, I want to just comment. I, I do this every year after the Workers Memorial. Uh, I have an opportunity to sit on the dais. Thankfully, I don't speak at that event anymore because how do you say words at a Workers Memorial? But I want to commend Lori for her. Um, her just presence at that, Brian, you also, your presence at that, and it isn't I'm a, I'm a political person that's standing here and I'm supposed to do that. I could see the caring in both Brian and Lori, the, the, the compassion that is there at the leadership level. Uh, I had an opportunity to speak at the District 7 uh, Workers Memorial because most of the districts also have a Workers Memorial, and the families are still coming. Um, there's one woman that came to, she's been going, she's been coming for 20 years. 25 years, 25 years this woman has come to the District 7 Workers Memorial and then comes to the, the statewide one. Um, and every time I go to that thing, I get goose pimples, and every time I see that, I just am continually impressed with the, the, 
family of transportation in this because it isn't just Caltrans people. You all show up, and industry shows up, and locals show up, and uh, uh, you had uh, you know, and I've had an opportunity to listen to all the district directors. I was trying to write them down: and Malcolm and Will Kempton and Cindy McKim and Randy and Lori and uh, and every time I just am continually impressed with the. Um, with just the presence there. So congratulations for that. And I hate that you all are still doing that too. So <laughs> um, hopefully we go a year without one. Um, real quick, I want to talk about a EPA ruling in, in the DC district court or DC circuit court. And anytime something happens in the DC circuit court, it affects the whole country. Um, so what I might go over real quick, it's an ozone ruling talking about air quality and uh, um, the there's three dates we're going to remember here. 1997 is your standards that were originally there. Then 2008 had a change in standards. And 2015 was implementing regulations to apply the 2008 change. The DC Circuit Court affected that 2015 regulation and the 2008 change. So if you had a, if you had a, a area that did not meet air conformity, it was a non-attainment, it was a non-attainment area or maintenance area based on the 1997 standards. And then the 2008 standards came and they said, woohoo, we're not bad anymore. You still had to do work. You still had to do some work like you were out, out of conformity, but you didn't have to do all the work that, as if you were out of conformity based on the 2008 standards. Those are called orphan areas is what they're being described as. Um, 2015 regulation was implying or was a, applied to the 2008 pretty much wipe that. So those five, so we have five counties in our state that have to go back to 1997 standards that they're dealing with now until EPA comes out with a new regulation. So there's the five counties are uh, Amador, Calaveras, Mariposa, Tuolumne, and Sutters. Um, so those counties, if you have a project, I want to make sure I'm reading this right. Uh, if you have a project that is with that, that needs a demonstration of conformity, we can't approve a R tip, an F tip, an F stip, any amendment for any of those. And it shouldn't be, it isn't a big issue at the very moment, but it could potentially be an issue later. Um, and then and that's a, that's an, a change to those. We could, if they're already approved, they're fine. If it doesn't require an air conformity, analysis it might be exempt something that might be exempt from air conformity in those counties then that's okay too um, but we're really looking at uh, the 97 you're really kind of going back to the 97 standard so uh, it's kind of a challenge right now so as federal highway we're trying to we finally working with EPA to get a couple things so we can move projects throughout the state because at one point in time kind of everything was being frozen so now we've isolated it to just those counties um, so I, I think it's going to move forward, but I just wanted to share with you some of the challenges that we're having in that area. Um, and then lastly, uh, Eric Shin, as, as a, in honor of our one DOT-ness, uh, Eric Shin is, uh, works with MARAD, Maritime Administration, and he's in my office in Southern California. We have a joint federal highway, federal transit, maritime office in L.A. So Eric had a couple things he wanted to share. Uh, so I thought I would let him take some of my time because you guys aren't doing anything today anyway. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll be open for questions in about an hour. Uh, uh, good afternoon. And uh, um, I discussed with uh, Vincent earlier and um, asking to steal a few minutes uh, because I think it is very important to share with commission uh, one of our dear friends, John Hummer, uh, is retiring on May 31st. Uh, John has played a huge role uh, while he was at a state level. Uh, he worked uh, very closely with many many of us in the audience during the Prop 1B uh, era. And then he moved on to Maritime Administration in charge of the Northern California Gateway Office as my counterpart. John is about to retire on May 31st. Uh, the agency uh, decided that instead of backfilling the position, uh, the agency is making strategic realignment. So I will be heading up the entire California, uh, in addition to three other states. And uh, <laughs> so I do look forward to working with you, um, specifically as uh, your, uh, your, your champion and cheerleaders, uh, cheerleader for your 
12 ports, 11 public ports and one private port. Uh, these ports play important role not only, not only for the state at a local level, but also uh, in case you're not aware that three of the 12 ports are nationally designated strategic commercial seaports. And two of them, they are designated as altern uh, alternate uh, national strategic commercial seaport, and one is a military seaport. And that speaks the importance of intermodal, rail connection, highway connections to our ports. So as you allocate your funding con consideration, please keep our port partners in your, in your mind, and because their, uh, 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 their prosperity really builds on uh, the, the interconnectivity on the land side. So lastly, uh, Merit doesn't bring a lot of money to the table. Uh, however, we do have some uh, less known programs that some port cities um, they have utilized in the past. Uh, one of it is called the National Maritime Heritage Grant. Um, so if, you're, if your city has a port uh, heritage that you want to fix up your museum, you want to fi fix up your dock, uh, you can apply for grants. And that's the money that uh, most agencies are not aware of. Uh, that is a grant that's administered by Maritime Administration. So as I conclude my remark, uh, we wish John Hummer to have a, a very productive retirement life, and I look forward to working with you uh, from this point on. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Um, could you remind Vince and your other federal partners that California does have those national strategic uh, ports, and when we look at infra grants or the new build grants, maybe we could sit down and chat? <laughs> we have been working very closely with almost every port as they pr uh, prepare their application. Uh, if nothing else, we want every port to emphasize their importance at a national level. Uh, and unless you emph emphasize your own importance, it is harder for us to hear at the federal level. So we definitely work with you. Moving right along, we'll go to item number 12, regional agency, Patricia. Good afternoon, chair, commissioners, assemblymen, directors, and secretary. Probably not exactly in that order. Um, my name is Patricia Chen, and I'm with LA Metro. And um, I'm pleased to say that at the Regional Transportation Planning Agency's meeting today, there was broad consensus supporting the staff recommendations for the three new SB1 programs and, um, and for thanking the staff for their year-long effort, their extra hours, um, their dedication, and their integrity, and um, just their general effort in creating effective programs. Um, we held nominations today for new vice moderator and moderator for the coming year, and we'll get some results on those in after a June vote. And finally, we discussed uh, something a little bit technical but very important, which is thresholds for state and federal funds, and that's going to be under book item number 28, and we're going to have a request on that today, and so I'll come back around on item 28 and talk more about that. And I thank you very much and uh, leave it open to any questions. Any questions for Patricia? Thank you, Patricia. Thank Maura, you. Maura, rural counties. Good afternoon, commissioners. Maura me, chair of the Rural Counties Task Force. The rural counties met on May 11th and discussed the following issues and concerns. In regard to the amended SB1 accountability guidelines, the rural counties appreciate the Commission's balanced approach to addressing the issues of noncompliance. The rural counties support staff recommendations to adopt the amended SB1 accountability guidelines. In regard to the ATP guidelines, the rural counties appreciate the Commission's efforts to balance the needs of urban and rural agencies. The rural counties want to thank Caltrans and Commission staff, especially Lori Waters, who over the course of 10 workshops and hundreds of emails and dozens of phone calls managed to draft comprehensive and equitable set of guidelines. The rural counties support staff recommendations to adopt the ATP guidelines. And finally, 
The rural counties also appreciate the commissions and the commission staff's expeditious and transparent implementation of the SB1 competitive programs. The rural counties support the staff recommendations for the trade corridor enhancement, solutions for congested corridors, and the local partnership competitive programs. That concludes my report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Maura. Any questions for Maura? Hearing none, we'll move on to self-help. Keith Dunn. Thank you, Commissioners. Keith Dunn on behalf of the Self-Help Counties. I will be very brief. I will take 30 seconds and welcome uh, Commissioner Jim Arp back to the dais, uh, a good friend of all of ours who we are very pleased to see looking as good as he can ever look. So, it's our SGR program for yes. the State of Good Repair. Yes, the State of Good Repair. So I, I, will, I will take, he's ignoring me as I'm, as I'm calling him out, but we are very pleased to have him back and looking, looking so well. So with my remaining time, I will say that the Self-Help Counties continues to work diligently to partner with our state partners and with this commission to deliver projects to show the citizens of California that we're good stewards of their resources, keeping promises that we have made to the voters and delivering our projects in a timely fashion. With that, if you have questions, I'm always available. Thank you very much. Any questions for Keith? Thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to item 15, innovations in transportation. Kim. Uh, commissioners, really quick. Uh, in January 2017, the U.S. Department of Transportation designated the San Diego region as one of 10 autonomous vehicle proving grounds across the nation. San Diego was one of these two federally designated test facilities for autonomous vehicles. The second California facility is operated by the Contra Costa County Transportation Authority, which you will, you will have an opportunity to, uh, to tour this August. Kim Kawada, the Chief Deputy Executive Director of the San Diego Association of Governments, will provide, uh, will discuss the region's vision and current activities for the San Diego Regional Proving Ground. Hi, good afternoon, whoops. Um, as Garth mentioned, yeah, we were designated last year. Um, this is really, I'm excited to be here. It's really been a model of great partnership with the regional agency, Sandag, Caltrans, our partners at Caltrans District 11, and then one of our own local governments, the city of Chula Vista. As Garth mentioned, we were designated last year um, one of ten in the in the in the nation. Um, obviously, up in Contra Costa, they have the Gomentum Station. You're going to tour it. It's really sort of a of a closed facility. What's unique about the San Diego region is that we're actually offering um, real world testing grounds here. But going back to the, the 10 proving grounds, one of the things that the federal government was trying to get is, number one, is improve public safety. That's one of their objectives. The second item was really to try to see if we can get goods and people moved around the country and moved around communities more efficiently. And third, one of their, one of their um, top things was also to see how we can provide connectivity and, and make connections for, for folks of all levels, including in disadvantaged communities. Um, we share a lot of these, um, these values and, and objectives at the regional level. Um, one thing I'd like to um, mention also that the Proving Grounds are forming sort of this community of practice. So we actually have been working um, in consultation with the other Proving Grounds and the, the goal is to learn from one another. We have some things that are test facilities, some things that are more driven by the automakers, for example, up in Michigan. Here, we're, we're a little bit different. We're actually offering real live testing facilities. The South Bay Expressway, which is our 125 toll road to the south, the I-15 express lanes, which you've supported in the past with Prop 1B funding to the north, which is a hot lanes facility that, that um, we're able to open um, and, and test there. And then the city of Chula Vista is offering sort of their local street and roads and kind of a more urban setting. Um, where we are in terms of the, the regional perspective, there's two things. So there's sort of a planning and public policy lens. Sandag, as your MPO, is responsible for looking out long range. So we're in the process right now of updating our regional transportation plan out to the year 2050. And our board, when they're talking about technology, we really wanted to say, okay, obviously something's going to be much different in by 2050 than it is today. How do we figure that out and how do we transition and plan for the future so we know that the investments we're doing today are going to last or be ready for the technology of the future? So at their last board retreat in February, they were all pretty unanimous in terms of, hey, let's at least talk about this and, and, and experiment with this in terms of our long-range public policy. There's also an economic development lens to this because if you look in um, San Diego and the county in particular, we really have um, a global sort of high-tech hub. I know you think of Silicon Valley, um, obviously, as, as sort of the premier thing in California, but here in, 
in San Diego in part to the relationship with the government and public and private sector and, and institutes of higher education like UC San Diego, we really have sort of this collection of cybersecurity, wireless communication, software development, infor information technology, and obviously the defense sector that are here today. And so we're trying to take advantage of those um, relationships. Um, what I've learned is actually outside of DC, San Diego has the, the highest number of cybersecurity firms, for example, in, in our region. So where are we on this? Um, we formed a consortium of public partners, industry partners, and academic partners to, um, on the San Diego Regional Proving Ground. And we had a first meeting in October of last year where we just sort of brainstormed, where does this Proving Ground, what do we want to focus on? Two things, uh, three things came out of that. One was, how do we use this to further advance connections? So how can we use this to figure out how this connects to communities, how it connects to transit, where do TNCs, where do automated vehicles all fit in? One is cybersecurity. What can we do here to understand that um, and to make sure that whatever models get deployed really has that in mind to make sure that you know these vehicles aren't hacked over the way. And then finally is how can we focus on outreach and education? You know that in, in Arizona, for example, um, Waymo is actually operating there. We see that obviously as an opportunity, but we want to make sure when these companies come and they test and they deploy, that the communities that they're testing in understand what they're doing and the sort of the ramifications and, and what to expect. So we really want to focus on that. Um, our city in, in South Bay called Chula Vista really wants us to also focus on can we actually put something in place and do a little test um, with a mobility hub to connect their communities and connect them to the trolley and light rail line. Caltrans has been a great partner, both at the district level, um, focusing their sort of our safety monitor here, but at the headquarters level as well, they've invested in some research that we've been doing. So we've done six focus groups, we've done several stakeholder interviews to understand what are public perceptions to automated vehicle technology. So we'll be um, getting ready to kind of report on the, our research in the next couple of years. Um, on our end, we've developed some infographics we're happy to share with the commission and with the, the rest of the, um, the state to really explain what's the difference between connected and autonomous vehicles, what are the stages of automation? You know, what can be expected going forward? Kim? Yes. I, uh, Madam Chair, may I? Those infographics look excellent. And uh, I think we'd love to see them up here on the dais so we could take a closer look. OK. Well, happy I, to share that with you guys. Thank you. And so coming up, where we are right now, we're planning for our next consortium meeting. Um, we're really, um, we'll be joined. We're actually being hosted at UC San Diego, their, their um, Robotics Institute and Design Lab. They're going to share kind of the latest in their automated technology that they're studying and researching. Um, we'll be joined by Deputy Director, um, DMV Director, Dr. Soriano, and he's going to participate and ex basically explain to the community what's the latest on the DMV regulations. He's going to participate. We're bringing in law enforcement because something that I think is really important is to really figure out what's the state and local law enforcement and how, how do they interact. If the police pull over an autonomous vehicle and there's nobody in there, who do you, <laughs> what do you do? Um, and, and we also want, like I said, share what we're doing with the public outreach and see what do communities need to know, what are they looking forward to. Um, stay tuned. In the fall, we're going to have a, a focus workshop on cybersecurity. Like I said, that's, a, that's another nut that we're trying to crack with this autonomous vehicle things because often um, cybersecurity is seen as one of the greatest risks of self-driving cars. Um, so stay in touch, and you can learn more at sandag.org slash proving ground. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. I do have one public speaker on this item, Jack Shu, from the Cleveland National Forest Foundation. And Jack, I'm going to ask you to limit your comments to three minutes, please. Thank you, Commissioners. I'm not a anti-technology person, but I'm also a person who advocates for economic and transportation justice. And that's why I have a concern with this item uh, with technology. You know, no matter what your energy source, no matter who is driving, to drag 3,000, 2,000 pounds with you when you want to go from one place to another, it's not efficient. So that's a problem. How much time are we spend on this topic? How much of a distraction it is from the real problems we have? How come we can't use technology to address real issues, such as City of San Diego's Climate Action Plan goal of reaching 50% bike, walk, and transit use in our urban core and throughout our region. That's where the direction needs to go. 
to me, this whole technology thing is a middle class solution to faraway things that may come. Who pays for these technology improvements? What does it take away from to the real problems we have in our society? So I don't want to put you know, cold water on, on Kim's presentation. It's fine. It's good. But let's not get distracted by this and put it where it belongs. A dream, that's fine. It is not our solution. I just came from the Poor People's Campaign, where this nation is addressing systematic problems within our with our society, and this is one of them. Just like the digital divide created a problem in education, we have a problem here thinking that technology is going to solve the problem. It's misdirected. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Kehoe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Jack, thank you for your comments. I, I think, uh, you know, you bring up some important points, but I, I am very glad that San Diego is uh, part of this uh, proving ground on autonomy and other digital issues. I think we're the perfect spot for it. I think more transit uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, other multimodal answers are good, but some of the numbers we're targeting I don't think are realistic, and we have to make room for everybody to be able to get around, and I think that what we're doing in San Diego uh, is going to benefit uh, across the economic spectrum. Uh, not not uh, exactly equally, but certainly far better than what people have been dealing with in the last few years. And I would point out the new leadership at MTS as a part of that conversation. I think you're going to see progressive uh, policies there. So thank you for coming. I think we still have to keep talking. Any other comments? Okay, we're going to move on then to item 16, state and federal legislative matters. Jacqueline. Is that working? Is that turned on? Is it on? Is it on? Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, tab 16 is an action item. We have two bills to present to you for your consideration. Assembly Bill 3246 by the Assembly Committee on Transportation is an omnibus bill that would make a number of technical corrections and updates to statutes that govern the state's transportation program. Specifically, we are recommending that you support Section 7 of this bill, which would shift the, the program adoption date for the active transportation program from January to April. Um, from April to July, I'm sorry. Um, SB 1262 by Senator Newman would remove the cap on the number of projects for which Caltrans is authorized to use the construction manager general contractor project delivery method, eliminate the minimum cost limitation, and make conforming changes to existing provisions. This bill is consistent with a recommendation from our 2017 annual report to the legislature that suggested the legislature find ways to give Caltrans more flexibility in delivering projects and their management techniques. Um, this could help them find the efficiencies required by SB1 as well. Um, staff recommends that the commission adopt a formal position of support for these two bills, for Section 7 of AB 3246 and for SB 1262, and to approve the attached letters, um, which are in Attachment B of your book, for transmittal to the author's offices. We have a motion by Commissioner Gometti, a second by Commissioner Tavaloni. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Motion carries. Thank you, Jacqueline. And with that, I want to thank uh, Chairman Frazier for joining us and let Senator Bell know that we miss him today. I think we do appreciate having our ex officio members uh, uh, from the legislature with us. So thank you, Chairman Frazier. Okay, item number 18 or 17? Uh, item 17. Uh, this is an information. Oh, we have item. to do 17. We're getting a little anxious here. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Stephen. Like. Sorry, we're still on item 17. This is an informational item, and I want to introduce Stephen Keck, who you all know, for an update on budget and allocation capacity. Stephen? 
Uh, thank you. So I'll start with the usual look at where we are with allocation capacity through the last commission meeting in March. Um, at that point, we had allocated 62% of the total capacity available for transportation projects. Uh, on the shop side, we're nearly all allocated in terms of the available funding for the shop, and that was because of the uh, emergency projects we had very on early in uh, very early on in the fiscal year. On the STIP side, we're at about 65%, which is right on track. Um, a lot of votes come in in May and, and June, so we're looking good there. Um, for the ATP and TIRCP, they're a little behind where we would like to see in this time of the year, but again, a lot of stuff comes in in the last uh, couple of meetings, so we expect that number to jump up. Um, uh, it's also time for me to give you a quarterly update of where we are with the G12. Each quarter I come and uh, give an update on how we're doing. The G12, uh, as a reminder, is a delegated authority to the department to make minor changes up and down on projects, um, minor changes to the commission's allocation. Um, through March, uh, we have a net savings of about $73 million in G12. Uh, on the shop side, there were 119 projects that increased for $62 million and 153 projects that decreased for $148 million for a net savings on the shop of $86 million. On the STIP side, you don't usually see negatives. Uh, you only see positives because of the way the allocations work for STIP. Um, but in this case, we have seven projects increasing for $12 million, and that all nets out to, um, as I said, $73 million in savings because of the G12. Uh, my next chart is the um, the new thing that I like to do every commission meeting. I like to bring one something new and interesting, and this chart is really fascinating. Um, so what this is is a 20-year look at gasoline consumption. And the bars that you see, the blue ones up and the red ones down, are the year-over-year -year change in that consumption. So what you're seeing is uh, up until the Great Recession, 2008, we had... Uh, constant growth it may not have been the same rate every year but you had unbroken growth and that growth goes back way all the way back to the uh, to the first Iraq wars in the early 90s um, you see right before the Great Recession a uh, faltering this is something I'm going to keep my eye on if I see it again I'm gonna change my investments but you see a faltering <laughs> in that consumption rate for the two years leading up to the Great Recession which of course occurred in 2008 that's when you see some very significant declines in the consumption of fuel year over year, with, of course, the peak coming uh, at a nearly 4% drop in one year of, of fuel consumption. Um, it, I think it's obvious uh, to all of us who work in transportation that this directly relates to our funding, right? We charge a tax on a per gallon basis. So for several years after the start of the Great Recession, we saw this sort of weak uh, decline in, in consumption. And then, of course, we're back into very strong growth, and we start to see consumption increase again. What's interesting about this graph is this little orange line that snakes across the top. That is the total consumption. So the bars are the year-over-year -year change. The orange line is the total consumption. Where we are today in 2017, or uh, at the end of 2016-17 fiscal year, was still just barely below where we were before the Great Recession. So we just, the, the most recent year we have data for is 15 and a half billion gallons of fuel sold. It was 15.9 billion right before the Great Recession. But, and this is the kicker, we travel about 9% more vehicle miles now than we did 10 years ago. So this is consistent with things that I brought to you before, talking about increases in fuel consumption affecting, uh, I'm sorry, increases in fuel economy affecting our revenue directly. Um, obviously, this is a, just another uh, tool in the toolbox to show how important it is that we start uh, continue to look at alternatives for collecting uh, transportation revenues. Uh, I won't go into what those alternatives are. Commissioner Medaffer, of course, leading the charge on, on road usage charges. Um, but I really like this graph. It shows some new information in a different way that we haven't talked about before. So this is going to be a, a keeper, I think. Um, with that, I'll uh, end with look ahead. Uh, today, uh, one of your next items is adoption, hopefully, of the final uh, active transportation program fund estimate, all the new revenues we got with SB1. Uh, the budget, of course, will be uh, um, passed, uh, hopefully, by June 15th, as is required. Um, 
at the next meeting in June, we will present our allocation capacity draft for the next fiscal year. Um, and I'll remind everybody, I think it should be on everybody's mind, but I'll remind those who aren't aware of it, Proposition 69, which protects those new taxes put into place by Senate Bill 1, is on the ballot uh, in June with the June primaries. Uh, I'm not going to make a recommendation with how to vote, but please consider it carefully and, uh, and vote. And that ends my presentation. I'll be happy to take questions. Questions? Yes, if Secretary I could, Stephen. I was looking at your last slide, and it looks like the truck has a bumper sticker. Could you it does. kind of describe what that bumper sticker is? Uh, so this is not the first time I've, uh, I've had this on here. This is the um, iHeart SB1 bumper sticker. Uh, and I'll say this. I, uh, I made that up one time. It's just a, you know, a fake, uh, what do you call that, Photoshopping of this fo image. But I have since seen big yellow pro SB1 bumper stickers on people's cars. I think it was a private industry um, thing, but I actually have pictures of a brand new BMW 5 Series with a huge yellow bumper sticker on the back. So that's good to see. Okay. So any questions for Steven? I have one quick one. On your vehicle miles traveled, you're including our vehicle miles in alternative fuel vehicles, Yes. Right? Okay. 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 All righty. Well, thank you very much. And in, in your new position, keep those <coughs> graphs coming because we love you for your visuals. Thank so. you. We'll do. Yes, okay. and thank congratulations. Well. So, okay. Now I'll try to move to the next item, which is number item 18. Robert. Thank you. So I kind of feel like a roadblock right now from the good stuff, so I'll make it quick. Um, <laughs> Tab 18 is an information item that provides an update on SB1 activities following the March Commission meeting. Staff is currently working on reviewing local streets and road program. They've received 493 out of 539 cities and counties have submitted their annual adopted resolutions project list on the new intake tool, meeting the May 1 deadline. At the June Commission meeting, staff will provide an update on the program, providing an, an update on the 2018-19 fiscal year fund estimate the 2018-19 eligibility list of cities and counties for commission's approval and a list of anticipated cities and counties that will submit for subsequent eligibility in August. Um, additionally, um, kind of next step, like Teresa Remy reminded me earlier today that um, staff's already th looking ahead coming up on implementation after today. And so with that, uh, we were been working with Caltrans IT team to develop an SB1 portal. Uh, the goal of that is having um, all implementing agencies go to one site on Caltrans' webpage for our tools and resources. And as we eventually develop the tools, there will actually be an online application tool on there as well. So the next round of uh, projects will be submitted through an online portal. Um, also, staff will start working on reviewing guidelines for the next cycles coming up. And so for your consideration today for this meeting, uh, staff will discuss the amended SB1 accountability transparency guidelines. Lori will present on the ATP fund estimate, the ATP program guidelines, as well as the ATP MPO component for MTC. Additionally, staff recs for the following three programs will, will be presented. The local partnership competitive program, Solutions for Congested Quarters Program and the Trade Quarter Enhancement Program. Starting this January, staff receive applications for the three programs seeking 5.3 billion, which is 2.7 greater than available funding. Oh. On April 25th, recommendations for the three competitive programs were posted to the Commission website. Staff recommendations include 2.6 billion in funding for projects that will increase safety, decrease congestion, and effectively more efficiently move goods throughout the state. Program guidelines were developed in a collaborative, transparent, and open process through many workshops across the state. Final draft guidelines were presented and adopted by the commission. Adopted guidelines describe the policy, screening standards, application criteria, and procedures for the development, adoption, and management of the program. Each program convened an evaluation team comprised of commission and Caltrans staff to review each nomination. Each nomination was evalu evaluated based on criteria established in each adopted program guidelines and based only on the data included in the submitted application. 
The projects recommended for staff adoption best address the criteria as outlined in the guidelines. Projects not recommended for funding were determined to be less competitive for a variety of reasons, including, but not limited to, nominating, agent, nominating agency priority, required information missing or unclear, or non-compliance with guidelines and statutory requirements. The projects not recommended for funding are, by and large, worthy projects, though not as competitive for this first of many program cycles. That concludes my SB1 update. If there are no questions, the first program to be presented for your consideration is the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program. Um, I do, on item 18, I do have some public speakers. So before we move uh, forward, uh, I'd like to ask our public speaker. So John Fasana from LA Metro. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, Executive Director. We want to thank uh, the CTC and its staff for the recommendations they put forward. It's been an arduous process. I know that as Mayor of the City of Duarte in Los Angeles County, we recognize the value of SB1 funding to help improve our roads and our infrastructure. Uh, we are very pleased to see the investments that will be coming into rail and highway in our region, projects like the SR71 closure and the SR5760. Uh, mix and merge project. So we also support the Cal STA's recent awards for the Transit and Intercity Rail Capital Program, which funds uh, some of our top priority uh, urban rail programs, such as the Foothill Gold Line extension to San Bernardino County. So we appreciate also the efforts that have been made for goods movement in our region, uh, for projects including the Ports of Los Angeles and Ports of Long Beach, and the Alameda Corridor East. Uh, we obviously move much of the nation's freight uh, through our harbors. So these projects, which will help us with some of the state's worst uh, grade separations as ranked by the Public Utilities Commission, Rosecrans, Marquardt, Turnbull Canyon, and Montebello Boulevard. With these being funded, we think it really helps to bring safety to our streets as well. So we're very enthusiastic in the San Gabriel Valley. We're very enthusiastic at Metro. On behalf of all the board of directors, we're very pleased uh, that these SB1 recommendations are moving forward. It's vital for our state and vital for our region. Thank you, and I know you'll be hearing from my colleague on the board as well, our vice chair. Thank you. Thanks, John. Okay, next up, James Butts. Good afternoon. I'm James Butts, I'm vice chair for uh, West Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority and the mayor of the city of Inglewood. Uh, and what we do for our hobbies, we collect professional sports teams. <laughs> but I'd like to thank the CTC for the staff recommendations to fund vital transportation projects that promote regional connectivity and improve mobility in LA County. Metro's SB1 projects will create a tremendous statewide benefit which would include creating over 30,000 jobs, leveraging almost $7 billion in local and federal funding eliminating 16 million cubic tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Metro is working with our regional and statewide partners to find ways to accelerate Measure M projects to prepare for the Summer 28 Olympic and Paralympic Games in Los Angeles, which will have the opening ceremonies in Inglewood, leading to more immediate benefits available from SB1 dollars. As the mayor of Inglewood and the vice chair, I also represent the South Bay region of LA County stretching from Santa Monica to Torrance. And I also support the CTC staff recommendation to fund the airport metro connector, the 96th Street Transit Station project. This funding is vital to deliver this project, which will support a growing network of local rail and bus services that will connect riders and travelers to one of the busiest airports in the world and the second busiest in the United States, Los Angeles International Airport. This project alone would result in, in a reduction of over 185 million vehicle miles traveled per year. The CTC support of Metro's program of SB1 projects promotes regional job creation. We're very sensitive to job creation in Inglewood. Uh, we've reduced our unemployment rate over the last seven years from 17.5% to 5.5% with projects just like this. Metro's project leisure, labor agreements will ensure that SB1 funded projects provide jobs and economic benefits for Southern California and throughout the state. In fact, 37% of the construction workers hired through Metro's 
project labor agreements that live outside of LA County. The recommended SB1 investment preserves and expands the Southern California goods movement industry, which supports 33%, one third of regional jobs, and 35% of regional gross domestic product. Metro's pro program of projects focuses on constructing major infrastructure and freight corridor improvements for the Metro Los Angeles region, including Caltrans highway improvements to improve safety and mobility to support goods movement through the ports of Los Angeles, Long Beach, and the Alameda Corridor East. In closing, I, re I really want to thank you and provide thanks and support for the recommendation of funding for the Green Line Extension to Torrance and South Bay as part of book item number 29 for the TIRCP that is on today's agenda. SB1 and Metro's program of projects generate strong economic output for California by supporting the World Games. Forecasts are that the Olympic World Games will generate 13 plus billion dollars in economic output. Traffic release, economic output, and keeping our promise of, to voters and employment are key reasons that we support this staff recommendation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm going to ask our uh, continuing speakers to keep it as brief as we possibly can. If we could be on a little bit of a word diet here. We love hearing from all of you, but I do want to make sure we have time for everybody this afternoon and we don't lose people later. So uh, next up we have Stephanie Wiggins, next speaker. Good afternoon, and I got the chair's word, so I'll be brief. My name is Stephanie Wiggins. I'm here on behalf of our CEO, Phil Washington, with LA Metro, who sent his regards. He wouldn't be here, but we have a policy committee underway right now. Um, I do want to echo our thanks and support to the CTC staff for developing a process that was merit-based and performance-based. We think that's really important to the criteria, and as you've heard from our board, we think it's really important that the commission make the vote today so we can move forward on the projects that are near shovel ready. Again, thank you for your support. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> Next speaker, Hassan Akrata. And Hassan, I had you marked down as 18 and 19. I'm gonna ask you to address only sure. item 18 at this time. Sure. And it looks like you have a buddy. Go ahead. I do. Hi, my name is Margaret Finley. I'm the immediate past president of SCAG and clearly it is a very fast fall from president to past president because they don't even script me anymore. <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to um, thank all of you for the decisions you've made with regard to SB1. Um, as a registered Republican in this state, no, I did not like what was done with having to um, get the money just without our approval. but. Um, I think I'm pretty much like a lot of people in this state and I recognize that we need the money for our roads And I think sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and say this is it. So anyway um, again I appreciate um, the the hard decisions you've made and we definitely appreciate it for the skag region. Thank you very much Madam chair commissioners secretary director Good afternoon. Uh, I just I, I have to tell this because Fran wanted m publicly me to say it. You are my favorite California Transportation Commission, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I really do want to appreciate and support your staff recommendation today. You have a great executive director, great team. Uh, it is important to put SB1 to work. I know the chairman is 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 listening to this. This is long overdue. Uh, Friday after tomorrow, SCAG, transportation commissions, private sector partners will be joining the governor, uh, the secretary, the director to make sure we understand the impact of SB1 and why it's important to stay in California. It will be the biggest mistake to lose this funding. And today is a good example of why we're putting this money to work. So thank you very much. Welcome to Southern California. Thank you, Hassan. Any comments by the fellow commissioners? Okay, with that, I am going to yield the floor to Vice Chair Arp uh, to take over. I need to recuse myself as I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of the University of Rutlands, 
and also my employer Majestic Realty has items in a number of these uh, or has related projects and so I will be out of the room and Commissioner or Vice Chair Arp will take over uh, for the next three items thank you I forgot I was supposed to give you all a bio break so <laughs> before I leave uh, 10 quick minutes okay we have a lot of work to